Are you glad to be here today? Uh, I'm louder than all of you, right? Right? Just now my wife said uh, she's a hard nut to crack. Uh, she's telling the truth. Uh. <laughs> yeah. How many of you of yours, uh, are glad to be here today? Can I have a show of hands? Amen. How many of you think that today you will hear the word of God? Amen. You know, I, when uh, this month the church is uh, teaching the area of, of discipleship, it says, uh, come, okay? Uh, connect, grow together and go, right? So this area concerns the area of discipleship. To some of us, we may think discipleship is a very basic term, all right? You, you, you think that you have known it all. But regardless of which level of faith you are in today, I want you to just open up your hearts, yeah? Open up your hearts today and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Over the last two weeks, as I was preparing this message, I'm also hearing, you know, the, the message that the Lord has given to me. So it, it is not only going to touch those who have just come to know the Lord. It has touched me, right? I have been a follow, a, a disciple of Christ for many years, but that this message that I prepared has also touched me. And I believe today that the Holy Spirit will, will touch most of us here today. Most of us who are present in this church today, the Holy Spirit will touch you. But just open up your hearts and allow the Word of God to speak to you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let us uh, commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this I thank you, Lord, for this privilege to be able to stand in front of your precious children to deliver your word, O oh God. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that every word that comes out from my mouth, O oh God, are yours and yours alone, O oh God. And any words of the enemies, we ask to be silenced in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you help, O oh God, our brothers and sisters here in church today, O oh God, to have an open heart, O oh God. Lord, so that your word, O oh Father, will touch their hearts, O oh God, will penetrate, O oh God, into their spirit, and they will understand, O oh God, what you mean, O oh Father, when you say, go and make disciples. We commit to you this sermon, O oh God, in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, Amen. 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 Are you ready? Yes. Okay, we're going to launch, right? We're going to launch, all right? The Lord Jesus, when He was for walking the face of the earth, doing His earthly ministry, He spoke to many people. He was speaking all the time, right? And if you open the gospel, the, four, the first four books in the New Testament, you will see what He spoke and it is written in the red lettered words, correct? And Jesus, when he was conducting his earthly ministry, he spoke to people from every layers of the society. He spoke to kings, he spoke to uh, generals, he spoke to centurions, he also spoke to the, law, the teachers of laws. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, normal people, people like the tax collectors, the fishermen. He also engaged with the people who are needy, the poor in the society. So he spoke to various different kinds of people. But to different people, he spoke different things. Right? And then, to this special group of people, 
this very special group of people called the disciples. Jesus gave intimate and penetrating instructions. Those kinds of words that people would normally give only to the close circles of people. Very special. Jesus spoke many, many parables. He spoke parables to the multitudes. But when he came to the disciples, he spent time explaining the parables. He showed them the kingdom of God. And in Acts 2, when God poured down the Holy Spirit, He poured it down onto the disciples. Jesus, when, before He left, before He left earth, He ascended to heaven. He entrusted His earthly ministries to the disciples. Why am I sharing all this with you? I'm sharing this with you because the disciple earns a special place in the heart of God. They appeared, the name, the, the word disciples and discipleship appeared 269 times in 253 verses. And this is in the English Standard Version Bible, if you want to check. But look at this. I've not gone there. I think we used the old slides. But do you want to guess the word Christian? You know, churches today, like, we like to use the word Christian, correct? Do you want to give a guess how many times the word Christian appeared in the New Testament? Anyone wants to guess? More than once. <laughs> it only appeared three times. The word Christians appeared three times in the New Testament. Two times in the book of Acts and one time in the epistles of Peter. Now let me ask you these questions. Who is in the heart of God? Is it the Christians or is it the disciples? Disciples. Disciples, correct? Disciples is very it's, it's, it's a group of people that is very close to God and today we want to talk about discipleship and before we begin I let the cat out just now huh, that we need to define disciples this is taught by our pastor Ashok before you start a sermon you must define first <laughs> so I get a point for that <laughs> right so the definition of disciple in Koine Greek this is common Greek huh? it's called metatis Right? It means the one who engaged in learning through instruction from another. It calls to imitate the teacher's life, inculcate his values, and reproduces his teaching. This is very different from what we call learning today in, church, in, in, in schools. Correct? What we learn just stays here in, the, in, in our mind, in our head. It doesn't come out. But when it comes to disciples, it is not just about learning. It is a, about applying that which we have learned into our lives. It is not about uh, theology, right? It is not about doctrines. It is about applying those truths in our lives. It is not just about knowing who Jesus is. It is about living and acting like Jesus in our lives. That is the definition of disciples. I want to bring you to our text today. We will be sharing uh, from the book of Luke. Luke 24, uh, 14, verse 25 to 35. This is about discipleship before we start let just let me give you a background of this text right until luke 14 jesus was gathering people right before this 
before Luke 14, Jesus was gathering people. He was going out, healing the sick. He was going out, you know, called, uh, raising up the, the dead, the lame, causing the lame to walk, cleansing the lepers. He went out to feed people. And you know, he fed thousands and thousands of people. So when you have someone who does that, what happens? Multitudes, multitudes followed him. But beginning this chapter, uh, Luke 14, the 14th chapter of Luke, this is situated in the third section of the book of Luke, where Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. These are all the, 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 the parables that are taught on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. So right now, Jesus is preparing the people. He's laying down the conditions of what it is to be a disciple. He's separating the followers from the disciples because he needs people who would eventually continue his work here on earth. So turning to them, he said, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even their own lives, such person cannot be my disciple. Can we read this together? Verse 27, one, two, three. And whether does... Can, can I hear you? I cannot. Okay, let's start again. Huh? <laughs> And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Verse 29, For if you lay the foundation and was not able to finish it, everyone would see it and ridicule you saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish continue huh? 31 or suppose a king is about to go to war against another won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000 verse 32 if he is not able, he will send a delegation while others is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure power. It is thrown out. Whoever has here, let them hear. Wow. Wow. What happens if we lay down this kind of condition in church today? What happens if Pastor Albert stays here, stands here and he says, this is what you need to do before you can be a member in Faithline Church? I think next week it will just be Pastor Grace and Pastor Albert. <laughs> right? So Jesus has laid down a very difficult and audacious demand. Incredibly difficult to, to meet. And if Jesus is not God, what he said would tantamount to idolatry. Right? People may think that he is mad. For saying this, it would seem to be a disciple, we have to give up everything. We have to give up every uh, relationship we have, every dream that we are pursuing. Everything has to be, we have to give up and put them under the Lordship of Christ. Only then you can become the disciple. Let us unpack this parable. Verse 26 says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father, 
mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even, even their own lives, such person cannot be my disciple. Why did Jesus use the word hate? Did he literally means that you need to hate your real, the people who are close to you to be a disciple? But Jesus taught all, in, 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 in all, in, in the scriptures, Jesus taught about love, correct? Is this a mistake? Did what Jesus teach at that time, did he, did he teach something wrong? Did he make a mistake? No, let me show you. He taught about love. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, he says, Honor your father, your mother, so that you may have long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Which commandment is this? I think we have taught this a uh, couple months ago, right? Do you remember which commandment is this? Five. Commandment number five. Yes. And this is, maybe some of you say this is in the, the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, Matthew repeated that, right? In Matthew 15, he says, For God commanded, honor your father, your mother, and whoever reviles your father or your mother must surely die. And God used the word die. Serious one. He's not playing, playing. Correct? So what, what did Jesus mean when he used the word hate? Matthew, in a few verse, verses before Matthew 15, he clarified. This is what he says. Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me, when Jesus wrote hate, he actually meant when you love them more than me, you are not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me, it's not worthy of me. What about wives? Remember just now I said, my wife is a hard nut to crack, right? So I better put in this slide so I don't have any problem at home. <laughs> Paul teaches this. Huh? Husband loves your wives to the extent Jesus loved the church. What did Jesus do for the church? Jesus laid his life for the church. That's why Paul tells us to meet with him. Right? That we should lay our lives for our wives. What about children? You all know who this person is? <laughs> okay. Malachi 4 verse 6, it says, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. God is bringing the children and the parents together. He is not telling them to hate them, not telling the parents to hate the children by pushing them away. Correct? And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, if you love God, you will love your brother and your sister. What happens if you do not love your brothers and your, and your sisters? So we will also doubt whether you love God or not. So why did Jesus use the word hate? In biblical studies, right, Jesus used what we call uh, a hyperbole, right? A hyperbole is when you use uh, exaggerated terms, exaggerated terms, right? Uh, in, in this case, Jesus says hate. The opposite of hate is love, right? There is a vast difference between hate and love. This is what Jesus is saying when he tells you to hate your father, mother, wife, brothers, sisters, and children. He is saying that you must put your allegiance to God far above 
your allegiance to human beings, to any relationship, to any things. He is saying that you should love God much more than any relationship you have, anything that you have. That is what Jesus meant when He used the word hate. Right? So after, after learn, uh, listening to this message, you would know when Jesus says to hate your father, mother, wives, brothers, sisters, children, He's not telling you to, to be disconnected with them. He's not saying that. Why did I put this picture of uh, Juliana here? She requested that I call her Juliana when I preach. I think about two and a half years ago, when, we ch when our church was meeting at the uh, Crystal Crown, right, we made a trip to Singapore. And Juliana loves to travel. The day you tell her that, uh, you know, you have a trip coming up, that would be her topic of conversation, starting that moment, right? Anybody that she meets, she will be talking about that trip. Any friends, whether it's in school, in her ballet class, in church, he will be, she will be telling them about the trip that she's going to have. So I remember driving down on a Saturday morning, right? Uh, and we, we took about five and a half hours to get to Singapore. Slow drive. Uh, but throughout that trip, can you imagine five and a half hours, she's talking all the way. You don't need to turn on the radio. Huh? Just listening to her. Right, she will share what she wants to do when she gets to Singapore and what kind of uh, activity she wants to be involved in, uh, the food that she wants to take, all sorts of things. Right? And she didn't rest throughout the trip. Long story short, we arrived, we checked in. Right? Again, she was talking. But when I arrived in the hotel, after driving, five and a half hours at my age lah, huh? guess what I did at night? I slept like a log. I don't know whether Juliana slept or not. Huh? But the next morning, what we did was we, we, we went, we attend church, but we went to the first service. Right? First service. And I, uh, the first service start, started at around, I think, eight o'clock in the morning. That means we have to get up like seven something or seven o'clock in the morning. So I got up and, and the, got everybody ready. We went to church. I think it's a thing in the church. Huh? Most churches we go to is pretty cold. I think our church, we have the same problem, right? right? You sit down there, the air con is, is, is turned on full blast. Right? So that, what, that was what happened uh, in that morning. And the service ended about uh, 10.30. We went out. Singapore, you know, 10.30 in the morning. It's cold. So we came from a cold... Uh, no, it's not cold, it's hot. We came from a cold uh, environment to a hot environment. And then at that time, I saw Juliana's eyes was tearing. You know, it's, it's like she did not look well and mother's intuition you know what jesus did she has the default palm tester that went on to her head hey got fever huh? fantastic huh? default arm this this is a this is better than thermometer she put on her head she knew that, that juliana had fever so we were trying to look for a clinic and it happened to be a Sunday morning. So we were carrying Juliana one street to the other street. But I thank God, you know, after walking about 20 minutes, we found, we found a clinic. Again, long story short, we went into the clinic, right? Uh, we registered and, and waited for the doctor. But at that time, I saw Juliana fading off. 
Her eyes actually rolled back. She lost consciousness. So, what we did was we rushed. We we we, we called. We we told the, the 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 nurse there. Please help my daughter. Please help my daughter. Right? And we went in. We managed to go in, and the doctors were. The doctors there was frantic. When you go to a clinic and you find yourself in that situation, and when the doctor is frantic, it, it is definitely not helpful. I think for the first time in my life, at that moment, I panicked. Fear gripped my heart. I panicked. It's like, you know, when you read the gospel, there's this Canaanite woman who went to Jesus and said, Jesus, help my daughter. Help my daughter. Jesus did not want to help her, right? But she said, what? please help me. That was what I did. Please help me. You know, the clinic made a call to the hospital and asked for an ambulance. Let me ask you, when you hear of that, is that helpful? The heart dropped to the stomach. Not only the stomach, the bottom side of the stomach. So at that time, I asked the nurse, help me, but nobody, nobody responded. They were frantically trying to address, you know, the, the situation that Juliana is going through. Even a prick, to check her blood, did not wake her. So I went to the Lord, Lord, please help my daughter. Flashes of her leaving me came. I, I do not want to leave, lose my precious one. And then God spoke. God spoke to me in the spirit, he says, you can only love Juliana in the way that is possible to human, I can love her much more. In your situation right now, there's nothing you can do. But I can, I can save her. I can make her well. And God says, would you surrender Juliana to me? Would you? In my desperation, I say, God, I know you will take care of her. I surrender her to I surrender her to the Lord. And again, long story short, about three hours later, Juliana regained consciousness. Let's give God a clap offering. When she regained her consciousness, the doctors could not find anything wrong except some viral infection. They could not find anything wrong. But, she, but the doctor did not allow her to go. Right? They kept her in the hospital for observation because they could not find what, what else is wrong with her. So brothers and sisters, this is what it is. When the Lord asks you to hate your father, mother, wives, brothers, He is not asking you to give up, give up our relationship. He is asking us to entrust all this relationship to Him because He can take care of all this relationship much better than you do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So when the Lord says, Give them, give them all up and, and, and hand it to them. He will take care of all this relationship for you. And I'm standing here to tell you, He can definitely do a much better job than any one of us combined. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering. Hallelujah. The second, uh, the second part of this cost to discipleship, it is not just relationship God is talking about. 
Verse 27, it tells us, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciples. In the Roman world, the people knew before a person goes onto the cross, die on the cross, they must first carry their cross. They, don't, they just don't hang them on the cross. They first hang the cross on them. And the people there knew that going to the cross is a one-way street. It's a one-way journey. There is no turning back. Luke chapter 9 tells us this. This is Luke chapter 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny, deny themselves, pick up the cross daily and follow me. How does this apply to us today? When we look at the cross, the cross is when your will meets the will of God. The cross is your, when your will, your will meets the will of God and you stand, stand out and say, God, I surrender my will to your will. Come, come into my life. This is what means by when we say, pick up your cross and follow him. Pick up your cross and follow him. Bear in mind, discipleship, discipleship is not a once-off payment. It is actually a daily installment. It doesn't work that when you say you have given it up to God three months ago, it is not applicable today. It doesn't work when you say, I have given up my cross last week. It doesn't apply today. Discipleship is when you choose to pick up the cross and follow Him daily. This is Napoleon Bonaparte. He understood what it is to pick, pick up the cross. He says that Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded empires. But what foundation did we rest our creation of our genius? It says, upon force. Upon force. Jesus founded the empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. The late Billy Graham says this, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost everything that we have. That is the cost of discipleship. Remember just now when I started the message, I say, it may not, discipleship, this, this topic of discipleship has also spoken into our lives. No matter which level of maturity you are today, we have not, we have not come to, to giving everything yet. We have not come to the point that we are able to die to a cross on a daily basis. Because dying on a cross on a daily basis is not something that you can accomplish by your strength. It is something that only when God comes in, He gives you the grace to do it. Secondly, discipleship is a choice. Discipleship is a choice. Jesus gave in this parable two illustrations, two allegories of how one should count the cost before you follow Jesus, say that you want to be his disciples. You need to count the cost. He says, don't begin to the builder, don't begin until you have count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost and see if there's enough money to finish it? One is not enough. Jesus put in another one to make sure he drove 
home the point, right? He says that king, what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counsellor to discuss whether his army could defeat the soldiers marking, marching against him. You need to make an informed decision before you embark on the journey of discipleship. The Bible has a good example. This is found in when Peter betrays Jesus. Jesus said, you will fall away. Saying to who? To the disciples, right? You will fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. We all knew, know that uh, Peter replied this. Though they all fall away because of you, I, 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 Peter, will never fall away. Luke has it this way. He says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to both prison and to death. Peter was fast to speak. We all know the story after that. Jesus, no, this Peter, what did Peter do? Peter abandoned Jesus, right? He abandoned Jesus. He was utterly defeated. Peter was like the builder who did not count the cost before building. Peter was like the king who did not sit down and look into the strategy whether he could beat the enemy or not. Church today, how does it apply to us? This morning we came, we sang many worship songs. I love singing worship songs too. When you sing, Lord, I come to you. Lord, I surrender all. Do you really mean it? Do you actually mean it? Or do you turn around after church, when you leave this church, and you begin to live a life just like us? every other one, every others in the world. Is that us? I believe when Peter said that, Lord, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I believe that the rest of the disciples would probably have thought about that. It's just that they did not say anything. Is it, is it reasonable to say that? What about the multitudes? I think the multitude, when you read uh, when Jesus uh, went into, uh, had the, what you call the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Remember the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? And a few weeks, few days later, in fact, Another group of people were saying, crucify him, crucify him. Let me ask you this question. What happened to the people who, who said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest? Today, in churches, it is the same. We come and we sing this song, I surrender, I give it all to you. Do you actually mean it? When you sing that song, do you mean it from your heart? If it's not, it doesn't make any, it doesn't matter whatever you say. Whatever you sing, if it's not coming from your heart, it means nothing. Think about it. But I thank God that our God is always gracious. Even when Peter, when Peter betrays Jesus, he did not just leave him there. Today, if we have done wrong, our God is telling us he is, he is there, He will give you a second chance. 
you realize in this scripture that Jesus actually came to Peter. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Question that is answered by Peter. Peter said, yes, Lord. He said, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lamb. Second time. The second time Jesus said what? Tend my sheep. And then a third time. Jesus said to Simon, to, to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And at that time, what did the scripture say? Jesus was hurt. And I believe at that moment, it dawned upon Peter that he had abandoned Jesus before. And then he also realized that to love another requires the dying to self. Peter suddenly realized that he did not have the material in him to be able to love. Then what did you say? What did he say? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. What Peter is actually saying, I do not have the material in me, but I want to love you. Come. Come, Lord. Come and empower me. That, brothers and sisters, was a defining moment for Peter. That is a defining moment for Peter. He realized that he, he did not have what it takes, but he's willing to obey. And he's willing to ask God to come, to give him that material that is missing. He did not have the agape love. He just had the filial love. It is God who can give you that love. And that you can then go out and love others. So the choice of the discipleship cannot be made on our own strength. Right? It is through God's grace that He enables us to pick up the cross and follow Him daily. So the next time when we sing this song, right, in, in, the, in the worship session, just search our hearts and ask God to come and give us the material that we need so that we will be able to surrender ourselves to Him, so that we are able to pick up our cross and follow Him, so that we are able to love Him the way that He asks us to love. And this is the third point that I want to talk about today. Disciple, there is uh, there's characteristics in discipleship. This is the third fundamental I want to share with you. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorous salt is good for neither the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. What this verse is saying, salt, salt, if it's function, in the function that God has, has caused it to, to do, if it functions, it is good. Soil, if it functions in the way God has called it to, to function, it is good. Even manure, manure power, if it functions, it will fertilize plants. But what happens if salt loses its saltiness? It becomes flavorous. Then it is not good. It is thrown away. It is placed even not worthy to be placed together with the manure palm. Very strong word indeed. The question here we need to ask ourselves, what is the call of the disciple then? The disciple calling 
is to season the world by making a difference. Season the world by making a difference. Today, when you come to church alone and do not do anything else, it would not make a difference. If we as a church are looking to add people into the kingdom of God, if we as church wants to see a revival in the kingdom of God, if we as a church wants to see the nation comes to, comes to Jesus, our attendance here in church will not make the difference. When we go to Bible classes and not applying the truth of what has been taught, it will not make the difference. You go to cell groups, go through all the jams and, and be with your cell members, that will not make a difference. All these are good, but they will not make a difference if you do not go and make disciples. If you do not step out and go and make disciples, because making disciples is the commission of God. It is found in Matthew 28. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when Jesus was walking the face of earth about three years, all that he did, all mi every miracles that he has conducted, every healing that he brought, every disciples that he gathered, all led to this. He is preparing his disciples and asking them to go out and make disciples. And I like what Chris Wright says. He wrote this, he paraphrased the Great Commission into the perspective of the disciples. He says this, the Great Commission is our committed, committed participation as God's people, at God's invitation and command in God's own mission within the history of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. Very powerful. This is what it's all about. If you read your Bible from beginning to the end, everything that God has written in there it is actually the mission of God, reconciling the people, the lost, to God. Everything that we do points to this. You know, it is our mission. I want to tell you today, it is not the job of the leaders the pastors, the full-time staff in church to make disciples. Ephesians 4.11 says it is the job of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Just because the church pays certain people a salary, it does not make them a professional disciple maker. I think don't have, right, that term. Don't have, right? There is no such thing as professional disciple makers for just the leaders. But if you bring that down to every disciple, maybe you can. It works. It is the disciples' role to bring disciples into the kingdom of God. Yeah. 
this area of miracles, I've actually wanted to take this up. And as I was praying last night, the Lord said, keep this. You know, there are great many churches today that are functioning, that are spending all their time in the power gifts. I want to make this clarification. I'm not against power gifts. I believe that God still works today. I believe miracles are for today. But if you begin to lose focus on what God wants us to do, the purpose of miracles, then you miss it all. Churches, even leaders, pastors, spend all their time just you know, seeing miracles happen, you know, teaching people to do miracles. But if you do not, you do not point all this work to Jesus, then it becomes all effortless. The purpose of miracles first is to authenticate the messenger, telling people that this messenger is from God. Number two, to authenticate the message, that the message itself is from God. But all this eventually must point to Jesus. It has to point to Jesus. It has to point to the kingdom of God. It is not for the pastors, it's not for the church to take all this glory, to grow their respective church, to grow their, the, the person's ministry. It all has to point to Jesus. Give you some scriptures here. John 2, 23. Now when he, this he is Jesus, uh, was in Jerusalem at Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Signs points people back to Jesus. John 4, 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told, Jesus told, told him, this is the person in Capernaum, the official in Capernaum, that you will never believe. So signs are brought to open people's eyes so that they can see that our God is true, that the message that is preached is from God. In Acts chapter 5, the apostle performs many signs and wonders amongst the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and they were added to their numbers. And if you read the book of Acts, there are at least 17 other occurrences where miracles points to the kingdom of God, adding people into the kingdom of God. The miracles at Pentecost brought 3,000 to the church. The miracles in Acts 3, the healing of the lame, 2,000 added to the church. The healing of Ananias, the city of Leda, or the town of Leda, the town of Sharon gave their life to the Lord. The raising of Tabitha, the town of Joppa, the people there came to the Lord. What we do here in church, the Elijah challenge, the healing that happens, we ask the people to come out to proclaim that it is God who healed them so that people can come to know the Lord. What about spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts is the same. Things like prophecies. They are also given to build up the church, to strengthen the body. What for? So that the body of Christ can then go out and make disciples. I like what Stephen Covey says. Today, if you cannot remember all that I say, Remember this, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Very easy, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. What is the main thing here? Christ. 
the main thing that Christ has asked us to do is to keep the Great Commission. Keep the Great Commission. He, he told us to go and make disciples. That is his last words before he raised into heaven. I did not make a mistake when I put this picture. All right? I want to teach this area about uh, discipleship. Discipleship requires obedience. I remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Carlson shared about this. I was so delighted when he shared this. That it requires obedience. This is Matthew 28, verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything. Everything means what? Everything lah. Semua. Hamplang. Longchong. Everything. When it comes to everything, means you got no choice. Correct. You need to obey everything that he taught. You can't pick and choose. Oh, this area. Right? Studying the book of God. Right? Getting the word of God in. I want this one. Making disciples. Hey, don't want, because this one deal with people. Troublesome. No. Jesus says that they are to come up. They are to, and they are to teach, teach, to teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. I put this picture here because this actually looks like my son's room. Those of us uh, who have visited uh, my son Jonathan in Melbourne, uh, I believe he has not shown you his room uh, because it looks like this. I want to bring this illustration to, to just drive, drive home the point of the importance of obedience. When I see this room like this, what would I do? I would go and tell my son, Jonathan, please make up your room. Right? Then what I'll do? I won't stay there. I'll give him time to make up his room. I will leave. Then I will come back, say, in an hour's time. Supposingly, right? Why I say this is because Jonathan is highly compliant. When you tell him to clean, he sure clean. But assuming the answer is this, he did not clean. I come back and see this room in the same condition. Then I ask Jonathan, why did you not clean your room? So imagine if Jonathan says this, that an hour ago you told me to clean the room, right? So I, when I listen to this, uh, this command that you have given me, I wanted to find out what the meaning is. What do you mean by cleaning the room? So I went to Mr. Google and I checked, hey, what is the meaning of cleaning the room? I tried to understand it. And he said, I kept this word, this instruction in my mind. Okay, it's like reading Bible. Huh? We say what? I meditate upon that instruction that you gave me. Oh, clean the room. Clean the room. Okay, I must clean the room. I meditate. And then, I went further. I checked the meaning of cleaning my room in Hebrew. Ah. <laughs> Hebrew, not enough. I went into Greek also. So I've, I now un understand. But then I went a little bit further. I checked what the scholars wrote about cleaning room. Right? And then he told me this. He tells me this. I have come to the conclusion now that cleaning room is good for me. Cleaning room is good for the Christian character. And then he stops there. So as a parent, how, you would, how would you answer? What would you say to your son or your daughter when they reply you this way? What would you say? Don't say anything. 
I think what I'll say is shut up. Uh, go clean your room. Uh. Correct. But that is what we do. Some Christians take on the word of God. We meditate on the word. We understand the word. But it never it did not go to where the heart is. That's why in the world they say the greatest distance in the world it's between the distance between the the head and the heart you can have all your understanding here but if it does not come down here it makes no difference it means nothing jesus said this in john chapter 4 verses verse 23 anyone who loves me will obey my teaching my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them this obedience brothers and sisters i'm not we are not talking about duty bound obedience it is the obedience that because it is because jesus because jesus in me compels me to do it when jesus comes into your heart you want to obey him because that is joy that is true christian living when god fills your heart he will comes he comes out through your mouth that is sharing the word of God. When He feels your heart, He comes out through your mouth. Martin Luther says this, yeah? we are saved by faith alone. I like this second part. But faith that saved is never alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is my concluding slide. You know, when Jesus was walking the face of earth, conducting his earthly ministry, if I'm able to look at his schedule, it will probably be very tight. Meetings after meetings people after people that he's going to see various kind of levels of people but despite his busyness he made time to make disciples making disciples we all know it is not a glamorous thing to do right making disciples is very difficult it's messy because it involves people it involves people like you and like me. It is messy. But Jesus emphasized on making disciples despite his business. Because he knew that he would not be ministering on this earth forever. The, th the same thing goes to, with us, to us today. We will not be here forever. Are we making disciples are we making disciples i'd like to welcome the worship team to come as we conclude this message <clears throat> maybe you do not know how to begin the word has come and he has touched your life today you do not know where to begin i want to remind you that we are we have just started alpha correct we are in the second week we just completed the second week of alpha last friday alpha is a place where you bring the people who do not know god to come and listen to messages Alpha is one of the evangelistic tools that Faithline uses to reach out. You cannot make disciples 
when do you do not have souls to minister disciple so the discipleship begins with evangelism i want to encourage you right to invite your friends this coming friday to come so that they can hear the gospel message maybe some of us here think that hey we do not have friends left to invite but i want to encourage you to just take out your phone open up your 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 contact book every single name that is in that book are your potential starfish everyone deserves to hear the gospel message whether they accept Christ or not that is not our job that is not our role that is the role of the holy spirit would we be faithful in his calling us would we be faithful to invite the friends who are listed in our friend, in our phone book for them to come to hear the gospel message maybe some of us here has been faithfully doing that but i want to encourage you today as you have heard this message do not stop there don't stop by making converts don't stop by making people christians but continue continue on invest your life in them invest your time in them so that they can become a disciple of yours duplicate yourself amen i want to invite everyone to stand up on your feet now because discipleship involves every single one of us i want to invite everyone to stand up on your feet i want you to just spend the next 2 minutes just allow the truth that has been shared on this pulpit this platform here today to 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 get into your spirit if the lord has given you names if the lord has given you pictures of people write them down write them down because those those are the people that god wants you to touch to you leading them to the kingdom of god remember a couple of weeks ago i used the definition of evangelism evangelism is participating in an ongoing conversation that the holy spirit is already having is it already having with that person it is you participating in the work that the holy spirit has already begun right if the lord has dropped the name the vision of the person write it down and begin to invite them let us just spend the next 2 minutes to allow this truth to saturate our spirits Thank you.